And so before we continue to study the depth of our inheritance in Christ Jesus, the unchanging epigraph of our study of the Word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And for us as partakers of the body of Christ, to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the truth of the Word of God and the revelation of the Holy Spirit, what is necessary to be done from our side so we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life and put on the new form of life. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And as we know, to fulfill this command, we need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs. And these are to put off, be renewed, and put on. We've noted that your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting actions, to put off, be renewed, and put on, will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath. Or more specifically, will the occurrence of our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it and our names will be forever blotted out of the book of life? In a specific format, we have already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the following question. What conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we begin the process of dressing or clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God, in Christ Jesus, in righteousness and holy truth? And when we speak of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that contains the power of the resurrection of Christ in the all-armor of light, we have concluded that we need God's help in the form of his redeeming mercy. The means of receiving any kind of help in the form of the inheritance of the mercies of God is weaponry of prayer or worship in spirit and in truth. We note that prayer isn't just a man's means of communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God. Man gives heaven this right so that heaven may intervene upon the territory of earth. Considering that the most powerful form of prayer is a continual prayer that does not back away from its goal until what is asked for is received, we together have been studying the format of continual prayer in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest, being a continual remembrance or memorial before God. The power of such a prayer is called to demonstrate the unlimited authority of God over our genesis and the allotted by him for us time and boundaries. Due to this, we came to the necessity to study the goal God pursues in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer or receive the right to approach God to enter into his presence, and also in what way and upon what conditions God is able and desires to give man the right to become a warrior in prayer so that man can present the interests of God in the implementation of his inheritance in God. According to the revelation of Scripture, our prayer as a warrior in prayer is identified in the virtue of twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, and our prayer needs to be continual, persistent, diligent, with boldness, with reverence, with faith of your heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, and in the Holy Spirit. In the previous services, we in a specific format have already looked at the essence of the first eight components, identifying the state of the heart of a warrior in prayer, as well as the quality of his prayer. And stop to study the ninth component and quality of continual prayer. This is the presence of the fear of the Lord in your prayer or prayer that is made in the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> but first, I would like to once 
again present the antonyms or opposite qualities of prayer that have already been a part of our studies, because understanding the context or background of each quality, we will better understand the quality and character of true prayer. Antonym of continual is unfaithful and not continuing. Antonym of persistent is resisting. The antonym of diligent is laziness. The antonym of boldness is audacity. The antonym of reverence is forsaking and hatred. The antonym of the faith of God is unbelief or resisting the faith of God. The antonym of thanksgiving is a person that's unthankful and hard-hearted. The antonym of joy is sorrow and brokenness that dries the bones. And the antonym of the fear of the Lord is the fear of man. As in the previous qualities of prayer, it is necessary for us to look at four classical questions. First, from what wellspring does the fear of the Lord flow? And what qualities or criteria does the fear of the Lord have? Second, what purpose is the fear of the Lord supposed to fulfill within our relationship with God, with each other, and with all of the world? What price or what conditions do we need to fulfill so that we can be filled with the fear of the Lord in prayer? Or how do we keep or increase the fear of the Lord within our heart? By what results do we need to examine ourselves on the presence of the fear of the Lord within our heart? In the previous services, we in a specific format already studied the essence of the first two questions and stopped to study the third question. In short formulations, I want to remember the essence of the fear of the Lord, <coughs> which is contrary to the fear of man. We've noted that the fear of the Lord and the fear of man are two absolutely different programs that come from two diametrically opposite opposite wellsprings, identifying the program of eternal life that comes from God, containing the quality and the nature of God, and the program of eternal death that comes from the entrails of the fallen cherubim, containing his quality and his nature. The first Adam, due to disobedience to God, was transformed into the programmable system of the fallen, cher fallen cherubim and inherited from him a program opposite of God's fear, which was passed down to all mankind and came to be called the fear of man. And so the fallen arch archangel, he had lost his virtue, his, he no longer has a title or name, and so he began to claim for himself the names of men and the names of places, and the names of places usually come from the names of the people that ruled or were owners of these places. And so when the devil himself does not have a name, he only uh, tries to claim for himself other names and uses these other names, the names of those people whom he can somehow deceive, and he takes the name of this person and begins to present himself so. The character included in the fear of the Lord, as with the previous qualities, is prescribed in Scripture for creating prayer as a commandment and a requirement and direct order that can't be ignored as a military command. The verdict is death if unfulfilled and a final break of your peaceful relationship with God. The fear of the Lord is a program identifying the life of God is identified as the spring of the wisdom of God and is a carrier and demonstrator of this wisdom. And as a program, it is able to exist and demonstrate itself in nothing else but a programmable system identifying the wisdom of the heart, which is the heart of a born-from-God man, that became a possessor of a faithful mind abiding in the commandments of the Lord. Psalm 110.10 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. And so if a person has the fear of the Lord, he will know how to fulfill God's commandments and identify them and will boast about God. We have noted that the reason for many misconceptions and wrongs is what our mind is dependent on or from. If we place our mind in dependence of men, that is, the uh, religious men, we will be pleasing because of our weakness, their ignorance, and their religious ambitions that they will call as a revelation of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> or the uh, decisions of the brotherhood that have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit or the scriptures. <clears throat> 
as the brother uh, brother uh, brothers or the group of brothers have decided that these are the rules that should be implemented. God has given the blessing to be fruitful and multiply. It is a blessing and not a command, but the brothers will establish that you have to uh, bear every child as a requirement. And so the brother, uh, brothers have decided that you need to eat everything instead of eating only enough uh, that you'll be satisfied. And so the brothers taught me, even as a young man, this is not for satisfaction. This is to uh, produce uh, children. And I thought I considered myself a, a sinner because it didn't come to my mind to uh, have a wife, uh, to bear children. I just wanted to be loved and love someone. And so they tried to incept this into my mind. Further, if we place our mind independence of the traditions of men, then for the sake of those traditions, we will remove or move the commandments of God aside. If we place our mind in dependence of logical form of thinking or obtained experience, then we also will be far from the fear of the Lord. Although the fear of the Lord as the wisdom of God isn't against logical or rational thinking because of its eternal being and existence and exalted nature in the fourth dimension, it does not depend on logical form of thinking or form of thought and governs logic. Therefore, only when we, contrary to many human authorities, place our mind in dependence from the revelation of Scripture, that is when we will be able to be filled with the fear of the Lord demonstrated in His divine and exceeding wisdom. We know well that the world that we live in has many forms of existing fear and even more phobias, and practically the entire world is underpinned by fears and phobias. But all of these forms of fear come from one wellspring, the fallen cherubim. These fears were inherited from the first Adam when he sinned and were passed on genetically to all mankind. And further, all of these forms of fear do not parallel or identify with the unique and great nature of fear that comes from God and is passed down by right of birth from God to man. We need to keep in mind that there, that any form of fear that does not come from God yields suffering. At the same time, the fear of the Lord prompts a trembling reverence before God and an unexplainable admiration that places a man in the safest place called God. As it is written, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 1 John 4.18 we know that love agape, the holy love, is selective. It, it is an enemy of all tolerance. It has boundaries. It separates the darkness from the light. It has a sword. And it's a two-edged sword. And so if a person violates the commandment of God, then this love agape destroys him because... It has zeal. God's love has a zeal, and this zeal is very, very strong. And so if our worship is not done in the fear of the Lord that contains the 12 precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, then it cannot be accepted by God. And that is specifically why any attempt to enter the presence of God, to call upon God or to serve God without the presence of the fear of the Lord, deeply offends God, does not consider God, and actually resists God. The absence of the fear of the Lord within the heart of a man testifies about the fact that this person is bound by the fear of man or human fear. And so the cowardly, when they will be marching to hell, and today they march to hell, then in the parade that is marching to hell, they will be first. The Christian people who were born again, that received baptism of the Holy Spirit, but did not uh, get rid of this uh, human fear, they march first. Because of the cowardness that they have, they are afraid to confess the truth that is in their heart, because the many people that 
uh, surround them do not understand the truth the way that they know it. And so they want to appear before other men as acceptable, not looking at how God sees that. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelations 21.8. The word fear, wisdom, and commandment when it comes to the nature of God are identical as they identify the moral virtues of God. And because they are identical, the one word describes the other word as they come one from the other and authenticate one the other. This is specifically why the fear of the Lord is the true wisdom of God, presented in the commandments of the Lord. At the same time, true wisdom in the commandments of the Lord are identified as the fear of the Lord, identifying the given law of God. And so now, third question, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that we can be filled with the fear of the Lord in prayer and abide within the fear of the Lord? In a specific format, we've already studied four conditions that are necessary in order to abide and be filled with the fear of the Lord and stop to study the fifth condition. I will remind us that the boundary of the fear of the Lord as a program of God is the boundary of the heart of a person that fears God, as the heart is a programmable system for the fear of the Lord. The first condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is the necessity to clothe yourself into the mantle of a student of Christ, raising or elevating a person to the status of a servant of the Lord. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord, Psalm 34, 11. And so it is necessary to be a student. It is necessary to have a father, a teacher, to accept the pastor as your teacher and to listen to what God will reveal to him. But if your pastor is not uh, specific on what needs to be done. You are in a club, not in a church, because in your church there will be a person placed by God that will, uh, will place learning as a priority. I asked one pastor, why don't you ever preach and he said, I respect the brothers. I give them the ability to preach. They, the, he, and so he, the only thing he'll say when he comes out on the stage is, you hear what this brother says, and then the second and third brother said, and let us finish the service. The second condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is having a pure heart cleansed from dead works. Hebrews 9, 13, 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, <coughs> sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself with a spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Our body is directly dependent upon our conscience. If our conscience is pure, our body will be pure. If our conscience is is filthy, defiled from dead works, then our body will also be dark. It will not be acceptable to God, and this will, uh, and our body will, uh, will be accessible to the devil. The third condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart consists in honoring, honoring the word of God and treating the word of God presented in the name of God as God honors and treats his own word. Psalm 138, 2. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. What it's talking about is that God has magnified his word above all his name in his holy temple, and his temple is us. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of of the Holy Spirit. And it's, so it's talking here about the body of a person that God has created so that it can be his house, his temple. And so in this temple, he can magnify his word above all his name. The fourth condition for receiving, abiding, and being filled with the fear of the Lord in your heart is the necessity to be a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch that grows out of its roots. 
There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. And so to abide within the fear of the Lord and be filled with the fear of the Lord, it is necessary for the fear of the Lord to become our treasure from which we would be able to draw power for the purpose of getting to know and fulfill the will of God, the good, acceptable, and perfect will. The fifth condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is the requirement to be an organic member of Zion. This is a a significantly uh, large uh, subject and so we've been paying more attention to it than others Isaiah 33 5 6 the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high he has filled Zion with justice and righteousness wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation the fear of the Lord is his treasure considering the extra extraordinary and destiny affecting significance of being a part of the past present and future Zion whose treasure is supposed to be the fear of the Lord, we somewhat have been held up on studying its power and its beauty. Because the relationship of God and his redeemed person and the salvation of the redeemed person is placed in direct dependence from being an organic member of Zion. Without a sensible and willful membership to Zion and responsibility before Zion and for Zion, the coming about of our redemption is unthinkable and impossible. Considering that God being the forefather and patriarch of Zion, exalted and placed at uh, Abraham, uh, technically, then, the destiny in every, of every individual nation and all nations as a whole are placed in dependence of the relationship they have to Zion and the relationship of Zion with these nations. Therefore, the nations that bless Zion will be blessed and the nations that curse Zion will be cursed. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12.3 Revealing the future times of safety of Zion and the destiny of the nations who are placed in dependence of Zion, we see in the book of prophet Isaiah but in another prophecy God says I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah an heir of my mountains my elect shall inherit it my servants shall dwell there Sharon shall be a fold of flocks and the valley of Accor a place for herds to lie down for my people who have sought me but you are those who forsake the Lord who forgot my holy mountain who prepare a table for Gad this is also <clears throat> an idol that that Israel worshipped at their time and who furnish a drink offering for many. Therefore, I will number you for the sword and you shall all bow down to the slaughter because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes and chose that which I do not delight. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat. Servants is Zion. But you shall be hungry, behold, my servant shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and wait for grief of spirit. You shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen. <clears throat> you shall leave your name as a curse to my, cho- my chosen. For the Lord God will slay you and call his servants by another name, so that he who blesses himself on the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten. Isaiah 65, 9-16. We have noted that according to the initial words of prophecy that has been for us a foundation for the study of the conditions giving us the right to be to the power to abide and be filled with the fear of the Lord stability of our times the strength of salvation wisdom and knowledge are identified as a treasure <coughs> of the fear of the Lord and they will come to pass for Zion when God will fill her with justice and righteousness which Zion will perform in the fear of the Lord And so when the chosen will 
uh, speak their verdict against the, those who have rejected the Lord, then will all these good things will come upon Zion. Considering this, in order for the fear of the Lord to become our treasure, it is necessary for us to have a strong and unquestionable evidence of our belonging to the sons and daughters of Zion. And for this pur- purpose, we need to know what characteristics does the past, present, and future Zion possess, and what conditions are required to, in order to become an organic member of Zion. In Scripture, there are more than 150 direct places in which the de- definitions of Zion Zion are presented, the purpose of Zion, the conditions giving us the right to the power to be an organic member of Zion. In Hebrew, Zion means famous, lifted by God, exalted by God, the mountain of God, immovable foundation, the strength of righteousness, immovable stronghold, a high mountain upon which God dwells, the city of David, beautiful elevations, the joy of all the earth, the fear of all the earth, the healing of all the earth, the justice of God, the house of God, the city of God, the place of God's rest, the body of Christ, the body of a redeemed by God person, the joy of God and the gladness and celebration of God. When it's talking about the fear of all the earth, and joy of all the earth, it's talking about the sons and daughters of Zion. They Only they can have the fear of the Lord or possess this fear of the Lord. If the multitude of the people do not know what the fear of the Lord is that attend the church, what do you think the earth knows? They know nothing about the fear of the Lord. And so they, of course, cannot be healed by the fear of the Lord. According to the given definition of Zion, the most fascinating and noteworthy is what the scriptures imply when they reference Zion. This is the body of a redeemed by God person who is a member to the chosen by God flock that for today still remains under the curse of the law that reveals sin and gives power to sin. Therefore, for the Zion of our body to become the treasure of the fear of the Lord by the means of the resurrection of Christ becoming ruler within our body, it is necessary to have evidence of your belonging to the body of Christ, that is the chosen by God remnant or flock. Previously, in a specific format, we already studied three elements containing the conditions giving us the right to the power to be an organic member of Zion and stop to study the fourth element and the first within the series of components in the fourth element in the purpose of the Zion of our body is the condition of the fear of the Lord to be our treasure. That's when in our life, as in the life of the nation of Israel, Zion becomes a stronghold, center and focus of faith, the capital and strength and their future hope. Second is the building of our body by God into the image of the building of the heavens and establishing our body as the earth was established forever. Third is the building of our body into the joy of all the earth, a marvel and fear for the kings that have gathered against us. And fourth is to hate evil, rejoice, hate evil in the carriers of this evil, rejoice in the Lord and give thanks to the remembrance of his holy name. Psalm 97, 7 through 12. Let all be put to shame, who serve carved images, who boast of idols, worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the soul of the saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Psalm 97, 7 through 12. And so for the fear of the Lord to be our treasure, it is necessary for the Zion of our body to satisfy the required characteristics presented in the given allegory. First, so that we rejoice and are glad when God, by the means of our spirit, will shame all of the betrayers who serve their carved images and boast about their idols. And so the idols and carved images is where when people rely and hope upon the gifts of the Holy Spirit, anointing, blessing, and service to God. Not to communicate with God, but serving God. Evangelism, uh, doing good work, they rely upon these things. 
And so this then becomes their idol. Every time when we replace blessings with the blesser, then blessings become idols. When we replace the giver for the gifts, then the gifts become the idol. And they are not given for this purpose. Second, so that we as those who love our, our Lord would hate evil in the form of the unclean, who divides evil against us, which will provide God grounds to deliver us from the hand of the unclean. Third, so that we, as partakers of the righteousness of Zion, would rejoice about the Lord and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Therefore, so that we, with the power of justice and righteousness that God has given us, shame all those who serve their carved images and boast about their idols, we need two things to differentiate those who serve carved images from those who serve the Lord and differentiate idols from the true God. We, rem we need to remember that wicked are people that do not accept and resist the order implemented by God in the body of Christ, called to build all and each individual person into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, sin, turning a holy person into a wicked person, consists in him not accepting the power and authority of the person that God has placed and attempts to take his place, disputing his decisions, because they are jealous of him and hate him. This is why they spread bad rumors about him and ascribe their wickedness to him. As it is, this category of people are only that category of scribes and Pharisees who place themselves as inspectors of the truth and helpers of pastors who are elected by him by his power and authority. Idols and carved images that the wicked serve, this is foreign gospel, this is a foreign gospel where the fruit of the Spirit is replaced with service to God in such aspects as their own personal evangelism, rebuking of demons, practicing supernatural demonstrations, and materialistic success. Therefore, to examine yourself as to whether you are included in the category of the sons and daughters of Zion, it is necessary to examine yourself on whether we are ready to pour out the verdict of the just judgments of God upon the unclean and the lawless who support them, considering that our close relatives and friends may end up in this category as well? And are we ready to rejoice and be glad when we hear that the judgments of God have shamed people worshipping their carved images and their idols? The next aspect in order to test yourself as to whether you are a member of the sons and daughters of Zion, it's necessary for us to love our Lord, hate evil in the form of the unclean and wicked who, pers who persecute us, which will provide God grounds to deliver us from the hand of the wicked. In reference to this, we need to remember that evil as well as good are actually battling between each other programs that come from two different, contrary to each other, wellsprings. Evil are any thoughts, words, actions, behavior, or goals that don't come from God. Considering this, it does not matter whether they are kind words, actions, or goals, or humble. If their author is not God, this is identified as evil. The carriers of such concealed nature of evil are people who received salvation but do not cleanse their conscience from dead works. Good are also any thoughts, words, actions, behavior, and goals that are done being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And carriers of such an unearthly program of good are the saints who have cleansed their conscience from dead works. Only they can be a programmable system of good. Further, we've noted and established that love and hatred are not identified as our feelings, but as the act of obedience to the commandments of the Lord, or the act of resisting the commandments of the Lord leading our feelings. Therefore, to love God and your neighbor is to treat God and your neighbor in accordance to the demands of the commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. John 14, 15 through 18. It is the same with hating evil in the form of carriers of this evil, is to treat the carriers of evil according to the demands of the commandments of the Lord. As written in many places of Scripture, here's one of them, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? It's not talking about the world, it's talking about people 
people in the church? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, be separated, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The third condition in order for the fear of the Lord to become our treasure is the requirement for the Zion of our body to become the place of joy and place of thanks at the remembrance of His holy name. We have noted that remembrance is a gathering of thoughts or a treasury of image information and impressions that are received by us from the physical world, from the aspect of the spiritual world, and from the aspect of the genetic line received by us from the physical seed in the sinful life of our fathers. In other words, this is information of the past imprinted by us in our heart and kept within our subconscious. First, these are words and actions spoken and done by us in the past. Second, these are words and actions of other people that look that took part in our formation and that are that we are witnesses of. Third, these are past events in, in the political and economic aspects that we experienced. Fourth, these are natural occurrences and cataclysms that we experienced in the past or about which we receive information about previously. Fifth, it is knowledge about God and about His works that we received either by observing the works of God in His creation, either by searching the Holy Scriptures and learning in the faith, or by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. According to scripture, it is this remembrance contained in man that identifies the essence of this person as well as his sovereign boundaries. As, for, as he thinks in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23, 7. It is the same with the memory of God that contains the thoughts, goals, and following that his words and actions that are done in the past, in the present, and the future. They identify the very essence of God as well as his sovereign boundaries. Because unlike man, God, due to his power over time, and due to his omnipotence and exaltation over time, he simultaneously is present in the past, present, and future, and holds the past, present, and the future. As it is written in John 1, 1 through 5, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's talking about Logos, the thoughts that he had. In the beginning, the, wor the thought was with God, this word was with God, and this, wor this identified the essence of God. It was in the beginning with God. And now it's talking about Rhema, as you read uh, further. He who was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And so an elaborated version of this place of Scripture that I have written, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, according to Scripture, of course. In the beginning, there was an informational program in the format of a thought, and this informational program in the format of a thought abided in the entrails of the Father and identified the essence of the Father. It was in the beginning in God. All that was made was made by the word that came out of the mouth of God, and without his thought, voiced in word, nothing was made that was made. In the word that came out of the mouth of God was life, and this life that was in spoken word was light for men. And the light of this word shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not able to take this word because this word devours all darkness. Therefore, the memory of God is the informational program of God, identifying the natural essence of God and his good and unchangeable goals. Revealed by him in his works, by his programmable system, which is the heart of a man born from the imperishable seed of the word of God which abides forever the holiness of God are the works of God and ownership of God located within the power and boundaries of the redemption by which we can judge about the moral sovereignty of God as well as his, as his good goals. The remembrance of his holiness points to the fact that the good works of God demonstrated in the ownership of God by their nature as God are eternal and changing and they abide forever. The memory of God as an informational program of redemption demonstrated within the chosen by God flock symbolically, symbolically presents a scroll, book of memories, written inside and on the back 
written in Revelations 5, 1 through 5. In the given allegory remembrance of his holy name in the form and of the work of his redemption is presented in the form of Zion, which is called to be the house of God and the place of God's rest forever. To open and read the book of remembrance or the scroll of Zion is to accomplish the verdicts of God's judgments written within the heart of Zion, to demonstrate mercy upon Zion and destroy the haters and enemies of Zion. <clears throat> because only after the seals are removed, then God's judgments are poured out upon the earth. The uniqueness of the book of remembrance of Zion, which is God's holiness, consists in the fact that everything that is written being written for remembrance in this book of Zion, which is the heart of Zion, is written for remembrance in the book of God, also being the heart of God, written in Malachi 3.13-18. The remembrance of His holiness is information contained in the format of the thoughts of God that are kept upon the tablets of our heart and confessed in the works of God that were done in the days of old. The remembrance of His holiness within our heart transforms us into the image of our thinking, identifying the works of God within our heart that were done by Him in the days of old. Therefore, the remembrance of His holiness within our heart is, dem is demonstrated in the right that we give God for the intervention of His mercy in our life. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple, Jonah 2.7. We will remember that due to our abilities which the Lord has placed into us in the moment of our creation, we are unable to keep within our heart the memory of the works of God done by Him in the days of old while also looking upon the works of men. Therefore, keeping the memory of the works of God within your heart that were done by Him in the days of old, we blot out the memory of the works of man as well as the information that is passed down to us from the sinful life of our fathers. To keep within your heart the memory of the works of God done by Him in the days of old, in the format of our redemption from sin and death, is a choice, role, and responsibility of man. Therefore, blotting out or erasing the memory of the works of God within the heart by the means of focusing your eyes and thoughts upon the works of man means depriving yourself from the right to eternal life and condemning yourself to death in the lake of fire. The memory of man contain, containing the memory of God is the strength and armor of man, and if you deprive him of such memory, he will be similar to a destroyed city. And so the enemies of man and the enemies of God will be destroyed. Oh, enemy oh, will destroy the city. Oh, enemy destructions are finished forever, and you have destroyed cities, even their memory has perished. The remembrance of the works of God within the heart of man is the inheritance of Christ. Identifies the it identifies the format of redemption and is passed down this inheritance from one righteous generation to the next. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever and the remembrance of your name to all generations. Psalm 102.12 The remembrance of the works of God imprinted upon the heart of man is the holiness of God and the component of His unfading glory. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holy name. Psalm 34 All of the miracles and works of God done by Him in the days of old can be memorable within our heart if they will be written upon the tablets of our heart as a revelation of who God is to us and what God has done for us and also how God sees us. He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Psalm 111.4 To remember the already known to us revelation to refresh our memory, I will bring forth four components. We have already brought forth four, four components in the purpose of the remembrance of the works of God contained in the memory of our heart, which is the holiness of God. We will remember that by having these four following elements, we will be able to examine ourselves as to whether we are included in, in the sons and daughters of Zion to therefore determine and examine ourselves as to whether the fear of the Lord is our treasure. In the previous service, we in a specific form already looked at the first two elements that identify the remembrance of the Lord's holiness in the memory of our heart. These are, the f these are first element, the remembrance of the holiness of the covenant that God had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Second is the place of worship upon which God records his name within the memory of our heart. The third element identifying the remembrance of the Lord's holiness contained in the memory of 
of our heart, which is the holiness of God, are the two precious onyx stones that are placed upon the shoulders of the holy ephod of the high priest. Exodus 20, 9-14. through 14. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone, in order of their birth, with the works of an engraver in the stones, like the engraving of a signet. You shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords, and fasten the braided chains to the settings. Exodus 28, 9-14. Having two precious onyx stones with engraved upon them twelve names of the sons of Israel, which are required to be upon the shoulders of our new person, is the established or confirmed given law of God within our essence. Because the two precious onyx stones with the six names of the tribes of Israel on each stone, mounted into gold settings upon the two shoulders of the high priest, symbolically carry the purpose of the two mountains, Ebal and Gerizim, which are our calling. It was upon these two heights that the twelve tribes of Israel, in their time, confirmed the given law of God presented in the format of blessing and cursing. Therefore, first, the golden settings into which the two precious onyx stones were mounted is a symbol of truth and righteousness, within the boundaries of which blessings and curses were called to function or demonstrate themselves. The two chains of pure gold made like, art- made like artistically braided cords and fastened to the settings is a symbol of the grace of God demonstrated in the goodness and severity of God. Therefore, the dependence of the two onyx stones with the twelve engraved upon them names, six on each one, their dependence upon the two golden settings, as a memorial of the holiness of the Lord upon the shoulders of the heart, is testimony that we we belong to Zion, which provides God the right and ability to function and reveal through us His perfect judgments upon planet Earth. Second, the two golden settings upon the two shoulders of our new person demonstrating the legitimacy and correctness of God's just, justice directs to the image of the Father and the image of the Son who presents the judgments of His Father. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. John 8, 16 through 17. At the same time, the two precious onyx stones cut to the size of the two golden settings upon the shoulders of our heart directs to both aspects of our essence collaborating with each other. This is the faith of God written upon the tablets of our heart in the destinies of the twelve names of the sons of Israel and our tongue confessing this faith in the appointed by God time and the allotted for us by God boundaries of truth and righteousness. And so our tongue the faith and the faith of our heart need to work together colla- collaboratively. Therefore, the twelve names of the sons of Jacob upon the two precious onyx stones present within the heart of man, and they present the order of the kingdom of heaven in the principles of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. Third, the two onyx stones mounted into the two golden settings upon the two shoulders of our new person, demonstrating the legitimacy and correctness of God's justice. In the tabernacle of Moses, these are stone, These stones symbolize the twelve showbreads that were placed in two rows, six in each row next to each other upon the golden table, which is why the two onyx stones mounted into the golden settings upon the shoulders of the high priest, as in a mirror, fully reflect the purpose of the two mountains, Ibal and Gerizim, from the heights of which all of the blessings and curses were confirmed, as well as the purpose of the twelve showbreads placed in two rows, six per row opposite the other. And you shall take fine flour and take twelve cakes with it. Two tenth of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial. An offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord, continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to them from the offering of the Lord made by fire, by a perpetual statute. 
Leviticus 24, 5-9. We can conclude that if a person does not know the holy and selective love of God demonstrated in the curses and blessings possessing a deadly aroma as well as a living aroma, he will not be able to have in his heart upon the golden table the twelve showbreads laid out in two rows opposite each other that would be able to, to be upon the shoulders of his spirit and the precious onyx stones and serve as a memorial before God. Therefore, such a person will never be able to be a king and a priest of God, to approach God and enter into His presence in the fear of the Lord, to present the interests of His perfect will, demonstrated in the miraculous light of His perfect and just uh, justice. And further, such a person will not be able to be a member of Zion, which is the treasury of the fear of the Lord. 1 Peter 2, 9. If, but you are a chosen generation, a real priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If we fulfill the condition to not harm the word of God within our heart and will become carriers of the holy selective love of God in the form of the two mountains, Ebal and Gerizim, upon the shoulders of our new person, then we will have a membership to Zion, which is the treasury of the fear of the Lord. The role of God in the two golden settings and the two chains upon the shoulders of our heart is that they present to, he presents to us his judgment in the revelation of his written word in the format of his severity to those who fall away and goodness to those who keep themselves within the boundaries of his goodness. And the role of, this, of, of the man is to perform this verdict uh, when he hears it in his heart by being instructed in the faith that is contained in the teaching or principles of, the, of Christ. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who felt severity but toward you goodness if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Romans 11.22 and so God does not shake or stumble if you continue in his goodness then you will receive blessing if not you'll be cut off and so if upon the shoulders of our new person we have these uh, similar golden settings with the two chains and have these two onyx stones mounted within these settings with the carved names of the sons of Israel, then we are kings and priests to God and need to carry his memory, that is his, the light of his justice. For one, from the name of Christ, we will be a deadly aroma and for the other will be a living aroma for life. 2 Corinthians 2, 15-17 For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient to these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God but as of sincerity but as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. The fragrance of Christ in the ability to not peddle with the word of God is the symbol of the eternal memory of our redemption. The fourth identify, identifying element of the remembrance of the holiness of the Lord is the breastplate of the high priest that in the memory of our heart is to serve as a continual reminder before God. This is the one item that laid upon the breast of the high, pri of the high priest that unlike the rest of the items that were reminders before God, it in status and purpose was a continual memorial before God. You shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen you shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square, a span shall be its length, and a span shall be its width. And you shall put settings of stone in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be serdius, topaz, and emerald. The second shall be turquoise, sapphire, and diamond. The third row, jacinth, agate, and amethyst. And the fourth row, beryl, onyx, and jasper. They shall be set in gold settings, and the stone shall have the names of the sons of Israel. Twelve according to the names, like the engraving of a signet, each one with its own name, they shall be according to the twelve tribes.
You shall make, and Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. Exodus 28, 15 through 29. The phrase of artistically woven work in Hebrew is the ability and requirement that is contained in the characteristic of a worshiper to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. To be artistic is to consider that's considering his word, his thoughts, his goals, God's thoughts and goals. To consider, to think, to reason, to meditate, to conclude, to come to a conclusion, to think deep, to focus your vision or eyes upon the invisible, to calculate according to the instructions of faith, to be ready to pay the required price, to consider yourself dead for sin and living for God to prepare or be ready to relocate, prepare what is necessary in order to relocate. We're not planning to live on this earth forever, and so we need to be ready to relocate from this earth, to value and treasure your time so that you do everything timely. Honor your delegated person and your instructors to weave, to spin, to confess the faith of your heart, to make plans to input or claim Christ's earnings for yourself. Practically, when the place of worship within our heart is in accordance to norms and demands of the truth in the order of God's theocracy upon which the Lord has put an eternal memory for his name, we will always need an element of continual memorial before God. This is the breastplate of judgment that we need to carry continuously at our heart as a continual memorial before God. This means that this instruction is specifically addressed to the uh, faith of the heart uh, that is to be confessed by the mouth. Otherwise, we will not be able to, with the joy of our heart, to be thankful at the remembrance of his name or the holiness of his name. When it's talking about it being doubled into a square <clears throat> and the length and span shall be its width, this is a symbol of the temple in Revelations <clears throat> 21, 16, 22. The city is laid out as a square. Its length and its great is as great as its breadth, and he measured the city with the reed. Twelve thousand furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lord is its temple. Revelation 21, 16, 22. The breastplate of judgment upon the uh, breast and at the heart of the high priest possessed a perfect... Uh, uh, pretty much symbol, it was uh, identical and symbolized as the temple because the previous temple in the Old Testament in Jerusalem was identical and was leading to the Great Jerusalem or was to lead you to the Great Jerusalem the, in the New Testament. And so the materials means and, uh, and means of the breastplate of judgment as a continual memorial before God we can receive only in one way that's being instructed in the faith. But to make the breastplate of judgment, to place it upon your our chest, upon the new person, uh, the chest of the new person is our responsibility when we renew our mind. And so we need to keep in mind when it's talking about the breastplate of judgment as a continual memorial before God, it's talking about the format of continual prayer that needs to be in accordance to the requirements and characteristics of the breastplate of judgment. Where we, entering into the temple as kings and priests to God, are called to present the interests of the judgments of God in accordance to those commandments and statutes that identify the unity of the principles and teachings of Christ and the 12 precious stones and the 12 names of the sons of Jacob written upon those stones. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, Colossians 4.2. Being continual in prayer is linked to vigilance where we see an identification of, and foundation or the identification of the foundation of God's commandments. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man, Luke 21, 36. The order of the building of the breastplate of judgment has uh, pretty much is consecutive and has 
an order that is followed. If it's violated, this consecutive order is violated, this breastplate of judgment that identifies the state and nature of a worshiper of God loses its purpose and its power. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23 through 24. This place of scripture talks about the fact that God has not yet found his rest. He has not yet built his Sabbath in which he would be able to rest and live because he's still looking for worshipers. Wor his worshipers will be his Sabbath and the Zion. And as soon as they are concluded, God will find his rest in them. And, and until the law of sin and death will be eliminated from our body by this law of the spirit of life, God will not be able to rest. That is the essence here. You may say, so today we don't have this. No, we do have it, because the scriptures say, you have this in your heart, and so call the non-existent, pronounce the non-existent as existent, and when the time comes for this promise to come to pass, God will see in the heart, look into the heart of every person, and if it's clearly written, this revelation upon their heart, he will take this revelation and bring it about, and he will throw out this uh, corruption and... <clears throat> process of decay from the body before the door of hope before hope is rapture we're preparing ourselves for rapture and so at the door of hope at the door of rapture God will do what? He will give joy He will give peace and we will be able to bear fruits of justice and at this time when this will happen, then the person that will possess such a body from which this process of decay will, will be thrown out, thrusted out, then any word of this person will be spoken, being inspired by the revelation of the Holy Spirit and in accordance to Scripture only. And when he will speak or she will speak, it will immediately be fulfilled. And he will do what? He will cleanse the church before rapture the church will need to be cleansed and this category of people will cleanse the church cleanse it and all of the so-called Christian uh, uh, churches from these people who think that they're spiritual that are of the flesh and actually are enemies of the works of God and the people of God as well, calling themselves Jews but not being so. They organize synagogues of Satan and have enslaved people by scaring them. They began to call the children of God whom God has sent to preach as if they are with hip, hip, uh, using uh, hypnosis to be able to attract people. How can I do this? And when we have so few and they have so many, it's more likely that they will be using this because here a choice is offered and there's no, no nobody is being tricked. It's strictly a choice. The choice is strictly presented and shown. And hypnosis is when a person doesn't understand what he's doing, but here a person clearly understands what he's doing. He is suffering before he makes a specific decision. You need to die for your nation. A person needs to die for his house, the house of his father, in order for his house to live, he needs to die for the house of his father, and it's not easy to do. And so here, hypnosis doesn't work. Hypnosis, when, when there's hypnosis, everything's done easily. Here people suffer to make decisions, and when they finally make the right decision, they continue forward. And so to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, you need to be a true worshiper. In the state of your heart, that is, in your motives, where a person speaks truth within his heart, and the confessions of your mouth, where a person confesses the truth of his heart. Upon practice, this means to not peddle with the truth when you pursue the goals that are impl uh, implemented by God, as people have done at all times and do still today, either because of their ignorance or because of their hypocrisy and their greed or their jealousy. It's interesting that the word uh, breastplate is of two words, consists of two words in Hebrew, 
It's Hassan and Hamespat. The first word means beautiful or decorated. The second is judgment, the place of judgments, law, justice, habit, ritual, religion, a benefit, purpose, and calling. There's so many uh, definitions or meanings in those two words. In the Septuagint, in our translation, the breastplate of judgment is called the sign of justice. The symbol of the breastplate of judgment finds its demonstration in the conscience of a man purified from dead works, upon the tablets of whom, as is a signet, the teaching of, uh, and principles of Jesus Christ are imprinted. If this will not happen, when a person is sanctified, a person needs to sanctify himself with for one purpose, so that the <coughs> elementary principles of Christ would be written there. If a person is sanctified so that he can evangelize or preach or perform miracles, then that means his conscience is not cleansed from dead works. He's sanctifying himself, and with the sanctification, he's actually attracting to himself himself the devil because God does not come to such sanctification why do you think <clears throat> when it says the house will be cleaned out and will remain empty and cleaned out and in order the devil will look back into that house see it's empty he'll he'll take seven more evil than himself and return why was the house left empty this person sanctified himself he cleansed himself because the sanctification the cleanse, cleansing happened not uh, by God's purpose or the purposes, correct purposes. The purpose would be to bear God fruit. But in these so-called encounters, sanctification happens to be healed, to perform miracles, to evangelize. And so even today, these uh, drug addicts and prostitutes go and preach and tell them how God delivered them and let's go. And they attract many others and many follow them because the price is easy you don't need to pay you don't need to pay any price you rebuke a demon and that's it but here you don't rebuke demons but you need to uh, get rid of your sinful nature collaborate with the cross of Christ it's a, a very difficult job it is written that we, these works of the flesh in us, that we eliminate them, destroy them, and not rebuke demons. Don't call uh, your sinful nature as a demon that we have inherited from the sinful life of our fathers. You don't rebuke it, you need to nail it to the cross. Pure, purified from dead works, conscience with the... Uh, Righteousness and faithfulness upon its tablets will they identify the nature of the true worshiper and will give God the right to function in them and by and through them upon planet Earth. These are the kind that the Lord is seeking today. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Ignorance in regards to knowing the truth, that is, the principles of Christ that came in the flesh will not allow a person to perform worship within his spirit because the conscience of this person is not yet purified from dead works and the conscience of this person does not have the truth in the form of the breastplate of judgment that identifies his right to approach God to present his perfect will of justice. So we can again conclude that the multitude of people that have repented, they pray. You may say, but they can't approach God. Yes, they can't approach God and they can't enter into the presence of God. But they have the right to pray as Hagar did in the wilderness. God can periodically hear their prayers. The prayer of a priest, God hears continuously, always. There's a continual dialogue within the heart. In my heart, there's always a dialogue between uh, between me and, me and God. There's always a dialogue. I don't need to talk about what God has done with me uh, before yesterday. I have many things I could tell you that God uh, does with me today. The things that God does continually inside. These people, when you meet with them, they say, I will tell you how God worked in the, uh, in the 30s or the 40s. And today, God doesn't work at all or uh, do anything today at all. Why? Because the time came out of being in spiritual infancy. And... So you need to con admit that you are still of the flesh. You need to die for this flesh so you can become spiritual. And people don't want to do that. 
I asked one pastor, are you spiritual? He says, no. If you're not spiritual, how do you have the right to teach? How can you teach if you're not spiritual? He's silent. He can't say anything. He knows that suddenly it was revealed to him that in accordance to Scripture, that a spiritual person has these characteristics, but he is far from those characteristics. He's And so it's very important that God immediately accounts our perfe- uh, His perfection uh, in us, or He sees them, He considers them in us as well. We confess the non-existent as existent with our mouth. That's where uh, the exodus from this spiritual infancy happens. When when you say, Lord, I want to, you don't just take it and throw it away. God will do the job of throwing it out. There's one who waters, is one that plants, but God grows. It's the same thing here. I, I kill, or, or, or I deny, I reject, but God will destroy what God will kill. By the law, I died for the law, to live for the one who died and resurrected. He will use the law that is in my body and reveals sin and gives power to sin. He will allow this law to kill me for this sin together with me. But he will allow this, according to Scripture, by the cross of the Lord Jesus, to submerge together with Christ so that we together with Christ would resurrect in a new form. And when our soul will arise in a new form, it stops being the soul of man It is the holiness of the Lord after that time. It is now the renewed mind, as I talked about, when the rod is, uh, was cast, or as Moses cast the rod, and it, it turned into a serpent. It's still a serpent, but God said, take it by the tail. The tail is our tongue. This is our control. When you take it by the tail, it uh, restores and is, again, a rod. But God says, now it's my rod instead of yours. God will perform miracles by using your mouth. Uh, uh, by the means of your faith, that your words confess the faith that's in your heart. The fact that you'll confess the faith of your heart, God will make it, God will do it, and the scriptures say that you you know that he will do this because he will not cease until he does it. And whatever may happen and however the devil may uh, convince you of or attempt to convince you of, many of you may experience very, very shameful sins and will be surprised. How is it? All my life, I never ever, and now, and it's always been terrible to me and suddenly I ended up in this sin. This will be for the one reason that in your heart there was pride and arrogance and you thought that everything you have is that you gained it for yourself and God will show you that you have have not obtained anything for yourself. And as soon as you understand that you truly cannot do anything for yourself and humble yourself in that, to be able to listen to the Lord what you need to do to incline your ear, no one will be able to hear the the Lord coming to the service if he will not incline his ear. And how do I prepare my heart? First, you need to pray, Lord, prepare my heart. I want to hear your word today, what you will tell me. I'm ready to fulfill it. And to incline is to humble, to be ready to immediately do whatever it is that the Lord will tell me today, I will do it. Because sometimes the Lord speaks and we, it is, we know it's the truth, but we don't have the strength to do it. And we find in Scripture another place that would justify my indecisiveness and such a person will of course not be able to come out of his spiritual infancy yeah for time god allows uh, or gives his time um as uh, the example i give about the pharaoh i often bring this example up the pharaoh Uh, he missed the time that God had given to him. God gave him lots of chances. The Pharaoh is a symbol of the human mind that first accepted the revelation of the Spirit, accepted Joseph, and gave him the ability. But uh, later came a different Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph and began to persecute the nation, the children that came from from Joseph. and And so in the ten plagues, the Lord showed this Pharaoh that this is my land, this is my earth, the body is mine, symbol of the earth is my body, but he considered it his own, and every plague was showing him this is my earth, 
and you with your mind are trying to uh, claim for yourself what is mine. And in result, we know that his best armies, his mind and all its glory drowned in the sea and the sons of Israel uh, walked upon dry land. And so we will keep in mind if the Lord reveals the truth don't uh, delay in fulfilling it because if he revealed it to you and you know it then he knows that you can do this let us bend our knees however who is comfortable and we will pray and may the Lord bless us in this prayer Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ we thank you for the opportunity to again and again hear the words of life upon this holy place where you dwell and in our hearts as well that has become the Zion has become your holiness you have taught us to call the non-existent as existent after we believed your words and received them into our heart and we thank you for the promise that will happen before our hope, our rapture that we rely upon that you will rapture us from this earth and you will change our body in the blink of an eye and they will be in the likeness of your glorious body but before you do this you will cast out this element of decay from our body you by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will eliminate the law of sin and death in order to show and provide evidence and confidence of rapture this will be that morning star that will rise within our heart and I thank you that this is already in our heart I thank you that by faith we already see ourselves as freed from decay within our body by faith we already see ourselves meeting you in the air upon the clouds the time that you talked about that, that you spoke of has come all of the world incidences all things happening in the world you already gathered Israel together you've done the most surprising things you are eliminating the enemies of Israel by their own hands because they curse you but you also intend to destroy those who are trying to rise against your church which is the gathering of the nation of Israel and the nation of the Gentiles as well you made them as one and named them Israel the warriors in prayer and so the great judgment and great wrath wrath will soon come upon those people who call themselves Jews but are not so we thank you that our hearts are filled with your justice with your fruit of justice fruits of righteousness we thank you that you have grown the tree of life because we have given you the opportunity to plant it and to water it we bowed our hearts and we thank you father that we can be your students we thank you that we can pay the appropriate price for our learning may your mercy be magnified for your people especially for those whom the devil is trying to scare and tell them that they will not survive this day that they will not live until this day that this promise is not for them but for future generations but you allowed our generation to hear this the future generations in the span of 2000 years the past generations only saw rapture but this other aspect of the mountain they were not able to see but now that you've elevated us to a specific height of your elementary teaching you have allowed us to see this door of hope the rapture that you will make our wilderness fruitful that in this wilderness your justice will be may your mercy be blessed for us we rejoice with our heart and receive this and we're ready to pay the pro appropriate price the price of our nation our house of the house of our father and 
our soul, our desires, however good they may appear. We want to know what is your will to be able to fulfill it. We want to know from what wellspring all thoughts come that come into our heart to differentiate evil from good and push away those thoughts that are evil and study and focus only upon what you say. May your mercy be blessed for us in the hearts of your people now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.